I am going to uh, start off just by asking you the basic boring question. How did you get started with all of this? Uh, let's see. Well, I knew I wanted to be in the music business in some capacity. I thought I wanted to be a recording artist because all the people I admired were. Mm. And so I decided to... I was very shy and I wasn't about to take my guitar and go and play around the clubs. So I decided that my only other alternative would be to get my foot in a recording studio somewhere under the guise of being an intern of some kind. And I did just that. I got into Cathedral Sound and asked the head engineer there if I could be his apprentice, if I could just hang around and watch him work. Uh -huh. Because uh, I told him that I kind of wanted to become a, a sound engineer at some point and maybe eventually a recording artist. And he said, uh, he asked me, why, you know, you write music or what? And I said, yeah, I play guitar, I write songs and so on and so on. And he said, well, okay, well then your first lesson, why don't you bring in your guitar next week? We'll throw some songs down on tape and I'll show you how it's done, basically. And I said, great, I'll do that. And so I had come in, brought my guitar, sang a bit. And when it was done, he pretty much decided that I, that I need to be a recording artist and not an engineer. So you had music to play then? You, you had stuff oh, prepared? Oh, yeah. I had, I had, at that time, I had written so much music, it was ridiculous. So from that, I understand, came your first two albums. Right. Although it, wasn't, it, it was never intended for albums. Because during the time that I was recording my music, I was doing it just to get it down on tape, and it wasn't for the purpose of releasing it as albums. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if I had wanted to release them as albums, I wouldn't have had any way of doing so anyway, because I hadn't met Kevin Bartlett at that time. Kevin is Kevin your... Kevin is the owner and president, uh, president of Oral Gratification, and had been running the label at that time to distribute his own music. And he had heard my music through the same engineer at Cathedral Sound Studio, and decided to ask me if I wanted to release my stuff on his label, and I accepted. Wow, that, that's a pretty good opportunity. Like well, it, it, it was and it wasn't. It wasn't, like it, it wasn't like it is now. It's pretty much a label now. Mm -hmm. Then it was more a name, mm -hmm. and there was no money involved. Right. It was just, you know, we'll take your music and we'll make some cassettes and we'll distribute them as, as best we can, which at that time was about... If I sold a hundred cassettes in a year, that would have been good. Wow. Yeah. You've come a long way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. So who who are you listening to this time? I mean, who can you say, okay, this, these were my influences? Well, let's see. During that time, I, I would really overdose on a few albums. You know, <laughs> we, all, we all choose a few albums that uh, are, are really, really hit us hard immediately. Mm -hmm. And we play them over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, I w at the time, I was doing that with uh, Close to the Edge by Yes. Uh -huh. I was doing that with, let's see, Never Forever and The Dreaming, Kate Bush. Hey, The Dreaming is the best album ever. That's not my opinion, actually. I think the best album ever is Switched on Bach. I was listening to that. I was listening to... I was actually listening... Well, Queen, of course. And mm -hmm. I OD'd on... I, I knew every Queen tune backwards and forward. Um, uh, a little bit of Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it was mostly Yes and, and Kate Bush and, and Queen. I didn't own any Peter Gabriel albums. I didn't know anything about Genesis at the time. I knew a lot about David Bowie, but I didn't personally own all of any of his albums. My brothers owned his albums. So you, but you'd, you'd heard it that way. Yeah, I got to hear a lot of music through my brothers, thankfully. Uh huh. As you've gone on, your your records obviously they've they've evolved, they've matured. You brought in more instrumentation. What was the impetus for that? Just because it was it was there, or because you said, oh, well, I think I'll try something else now, or were you listening to different things? Well, something like that is a natural progression. Mm -hmm. Some artists don't take that direction. Some artists like a folk sound. Other artists like a, like a garage-type sound, which, I mean, that's just the term I use to mm -hmm. describe the kick, snare, strumming guitar sound. Right. The very simple, basic rock sound. I was always leading, heading down the path of electronics 
and orchestration and lots of instrumentation and, and kind of polished production and I don't I guess because of yes and mm-hmm. queen but so that was a natural progression for me I started out simply because that's all I had mm-hmm. it was inevitable that I would eventually obtain a lot of other instruments and, and broaden my horizons thematically I think you've changed as well too when I listen last night I listened to Equipoise which is your new album and then I listened to Rhodes One which was the first one and doing that I'm really struck by how you're coming at things from a different angle yeah definitely I think I, I was young when I was writing this stuff that appears on Rhodes One Rhodes Two and really Rearmament and Necto as well mm-hmm. and that's not a defense or justification. It's just a fact. I was very young, mm-hmm. and I was an alienate, alienated young person. And, you know, obviously that's going to be reflected in the music mm-hmm. at the time. So um, I can't identify with it anymore necessarily, but I definitely stand behind it. I definitely recognize it uh-huh. for what it was. And again, the content is also a natural progression. It's inevitable, you know. The more you learn, the more you experience, the the more broad your horizons become. You seem to have moved from the inner to the outer, where some songs on Equipoise, you know, you're talking about in Save Our Souls, the irony of, of here we are on this planet that has all these problems, yet we're looking out into space for our saviors. Mm-hmm. Even on, on War Paint, your fifth album starts off with the world's words, you know, we're waking up, yes, it's good, you're getting kind of a, I hate the word, but kind of political bent to things. Not any more so than War Paint, I think. Mm-hmm. On War Paint, that meant, when I, meant what I said when I wrote Waking Up, and that was specifically referring to all the people in the world who are doing amazing things to save human beings, to save animals, to save the environment. Uh-huh. People are, are taking enormous leaps and bounds to accomplish things that seem unaccomplishable by by single human beings yet they're out there doing it and i'm very impressed by these human beings i don't consider myself to be one of them and so i'm in awe of them Uh and i'm glad they're here and they're all around us and other songs on war paint like to live in your world that's about the death penalty there's murder there's all kinds of stuff uh, that i think have a political bent on that album and i thought equipoise was a little lighter in political content mm-hmm. if you want the truth i mean it's political and which was what was my political song in in equipoise i mean do you think i say is kind of uh, uh save our souls is a political save our souls and in a in a way uh runners i think that's the one that seems to me of course you could also say play the game which kind of tackles feminism but runners talking about toxic dumps and things that coming again you're going to steal my heartbeat things that seem like (laughs) even the air you breathe can kill you if you listen to the right news reports well the thing is with runners is that my point is not the world is going down the tubes and looking at everything that's happening to our environment my point is we're all too too damned afraid of dying and it's got to stop ah it's it's tongue-in-cheek it is tongue-in-cheek yes it is okay I, I, i get i'm very tired of all the, the reports of the carcinogens and, and, and what causes this and what causes that. And, and everybody really, really believes it and eats it up. And we all immediately go out and try and get the first product that, that seems like it's going to cure us of that. Mm-hmm. So, so you weren't the first person out there buying oat bran? Oh, I'm not saying that. I put <laughs> myself right in line with everyone else. Really? Definitely. Uh, it's really hard. It's a very hard struggle for me. I don't like it, and so uh, on a on a daily basis, I really try and not fall into a certain set of beliefs mm-hmm. that we tend to do. But it's really hard. Yeah, it's, yeah. Everyone is is so influenced by everything around them. Right. Another thing that becomes quite obvious when listening to any one of your albums is um, these little science fiction themes that keep popping up, aliens and uh, monsters and that sort of thing. Mm. I can only assume from that that you are an SF fan to a degree. A a, a what fan? Science fiction, SF. Oh. I usually go the full sci-fi myself. Oh, well, sci-fi, I think (laughs) think the cockroach that ate Cincinnati. (laughs) 
Well, um, I, I am a big uh, science fiction fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should rephrase that. I'm probably a medium science fiction medium. fan. Only in that I'm not... I'm not ardent about it. I, I'm not... You don't go to the conventions and exactly. dress up and... <laughs> right. I mean, you know, people sometimes ask me if I know this comic book or, or, you know, this really cult type of underground stuff, hardcore science fiction fan type things. And, uh, no, I'm nowhere near like that. I mean, who do you read? I don't tend to read anyone in, no. per- in particular. I read whatever. I, I mean, I'm really trying to catch up on a lot of classical uh-huh. science fiction do you have any that you consider your, your favorites, or do you just read whatever looks interesting? Hmm. Basically, I read whatever looks interesting. Mm-hmm. I can't... I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular that... I, I really, really liked the Dune series. I'm not even through it yet. I, I think they're really... Some of the best written, most tastefully written science fiction that I've ever read. And I'm not well read, and I tell that to everyone because the minute I say, "Oh, I love science fiction," I love to read science fiction, everybody starts rattling off. Well, of course you know. Have <laughs> you read blah 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 by blah, blah blah? And you know, and I'm like standing here going, "Uh, no." Yeah, I'm like an idiot. Do you like vampires? Um, the ones I know personally are nice. I <laughs> was- um, I I asked that because of the two songs on Equipoise, "He Will Come" and "The Flight." Yeah, which. I believe cannot be separated. I think, like, there would be some earthquake somewhere. I if think it, so. I think a person would definitely implode if they tried. I always play them together. How did you come to do that? Did you just... Was there a specific story? Or was it a dream you had? Or Well, no. You know what? The, this is... It's really strange, but I do love vampire stories. I've always loved vampire movies. Really good ones. I hate corny ones. I, I mean, I remember when I was younger and I saw Salem's Lot for the first time and I just, I, I thought that was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I, I needed more immediately. I like vampire stories, all kinds of vampire stories. And the funny thing is that, you know, the, the big movie this past December was Bram Stoker's Dracula. And I've never read Bram Stoker's Dracula, never knew what the story was had seen one version of Nosferatu, but didn't really retain much of it a couple years ago, a year and a half, maybe two years ago, right around the time when I was playing out live for the War Paint album. I wrote He Will Come and The Flight. Right, you, you performed those live. Right, and I, I thought I was making this story up. Uh, used the name Gabrielle just purely because I liked the name. And I made up, well, gee, what would be a really romantic, incredible scenario? So I made it up. Then I saw Bram Stoker's Dracula, like, a year later, and found out that Bram Stoker is this author who wrote this story before I ever thought of it. (laughs) Basically the same story. And I was pretty bummed, needless to say. I left the theater and I said, damn, I thought I was really (laughs) original here. Oh, but great minds think alike, don't you? Well, (laughs) thanks. Um, and they used Annie Lennox's song on the end of the movie, and I said, oh, shit, man, I, oh, I was so envious of that. Well, maybe some other great vampire movie will come out that, you know, become a classic, and uh, they'll, they'll use your music at the end of it. I hope and pray. <laughs> um, a lot of your earlier songs seem to be not... More, well, maybe more straightforward. You could listen to it and say, okay, you know, I, I know I can see what's going on and either identify with it or I don't. But on Equipoise, there are a couple songs that seem to be escaping people. Mm-hmm. And one of them is Out Like a Lamb, mm-hmm. which is by far my favorite song on the album. I just mm-hmm. listen to it over and over and over. Cool. For, for many different reasons. One of them is that every time I listen to it, I just try to figure out, God, what is this song about? Um, would you care to shed any light on that? Yeah. It's definitely about my father. And my father, which is no you know, unique theme. A lot of people write <clears throat> songs about their relatives, usually after they've passed on, which my father did. And I thought it was a particularly interesting way that he died it was very quiet, and I thought that was really interesting because I remembered him. I hadn't really I left my father when I was young. I was 11 years old, in fact, when, when I stopped living with my father, and I hadn't really seen him. I saw him probably once after that. 
wow. when I was an adult. And my memories of him were that of a, a really intelligent, vivacious type of humorous, funny man. And I always loved him a lot, and I was always very, I always had this pride about my father. His life kind of, he kind of like slipped out without telling anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, he got very, very ill, and uh, he stopped being gregarious. He stopped doing things with his life. His, his, he became a little more quiet, and he died. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think, I mean, these are just the, the perceptions of a child, you mm-hmm. know? Right. It's not how necessarily how he really was or how other people saw him. But because I remember him as a, a little girl, I remember him as being this larger-than-life savior, this man who was uh, just like a burning fire. And I was so always so glad and proud to be around him. And it was very strange to me that when he died, he, he just kind of did it very quietly, and nobody, it was like he, he had never been here at all. It was just a very strange thing, and I thought it was a, a, a strange choice. And so I sang about it. Was it hard to write? Uh, I don't think so. It wasn't hard to write, and in fact, I never planned on writing a song necessarily about my father, about my father's death. In fact, it didn't come right when he died. It, it came very, very late after. I mean, more than a year passed. And because I, I write the music first, I don't write, start out with lyrics. I wrote the music for Out Like a Lamb, and uh, I listened to it, and immediately knew that it you know, started singing to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'll call me when he's back in town. In fact, that was the first line I sang. Really? Yeah. So that's when I knew, oh, well, okay, I guess this one's about my father. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the re- and then the rest of it just followed. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bagpipe in it. Right. There's um, a bagpipe at the end of it. And, yeah, it goes on at the end. Is that kind of... Well, actually, the, the uh, bagpipe within the song is, an, is a guitar. Okay. That's uh, that's Kevin's crafty guitar work. Uh huh. Yeah. Clever. Yeah, and the real bagpipe is only at the end of the song. Right. It's definitely and I a really neat touch, especially knowing now what the what the song is about. It seems to make perfect sense. Well, my father. To clarify that further, my father was a bagpipe freak. Ah. Uh. He loved bagpipe music. So. Uh, yeah, he was the one who got me. So. I'm sure he's the reason I'm so musical. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had the album switched on Bach, and he used to play music constantly. It was very important to him. He wasn't musical, though. Mm-hmm. He was a painter, but he couldn't, he, you know, he wasn't a musician, but he loved listening to it. And so that's that's what got me going, I'm sure. Yeah. So, so he was a painter. Now, you paint, yeah. right? Um, you've done... Let's see, looking. I think you have paintings on four of your album covers. Well, three and a half. (laughs) And they're all about, they're all monsters. Mm Mm-hmm. Which Which not all my paintings are, but... But the the, the ones you you chose for your album covers have all been monsters. Why why is that? Aren't you afraid that, you know, maybe someone's going to look at your CD in Tower and say, oh, this must be some death metal. (laughs) Yeah, people do that all the time. Uh, But, you know, to begin with, I'm not the type of artist, I'm not going to plaster a picture of me with my cleavage hanging out <laughs> on the cover just so that somebody who's never heard of me before can pick up the album and go, whoa, hey, I want to get this. <laughs> you know? It's, yeah. I think really uh, the people who've heard my music who like it, who purposely go into a store seeking a Happy Roads album, you know, I yeah. don't think they're going to go, oh, heavy metal. Put it back. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I have a lot of weird, different reactions to the covers and first I have to say that I never planned on the first four albums the covers were done out of necessity more than artistic direction and it was because uh, again I never created these to be albums but when it came time that I had to do some kind of presentation because people were going to be paying money for it, I said, well, I have this painting, I'll just put that on the front. And, and it's kind of stuck, and I kind of liked it. I mean, it's the kind of stuff I would want to look at. Right. So that's, you know, that's my only motivation right there. But then War Paint came along, and Michael right. Poise, and... War Paint is just a picture of you. Right. 
But Oracle Poise, you've gone, well, half back two months. There's half of you and half of this interesting right. green monster thing. <laughs> That's a good description. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, equipoise itself means state of balance, mm -hmm. um, and you have these neat little scales on the back. I can guess that uh, the half and halfness of this cover here has something to do with that. Well, yeah, that ha that has everything to do with it. Everything. Mm -hmm. It's the old. I feel like I, I can d explain this to you, but I have the feeling you know this already. <laughs> it's a little weird. I know you know this. Right. Do you want me to go into it? People in central Connecticut don't know it. In, uh, the, in a nutshell, unless you don't want to. <laughs> well, no. I think it's really important that people in central Connecticut know this. Okay. During the time that I was writing the music for the album, I I, I go through phases in life, just mm -hmm. like everybody, where you, you wake up one morning and you have a revelation. All of a sudden, you stop acting a certain way. You decide, oh, I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to be more like this. Mm -hmm. And you do. It never seems quite that plain. It's usually more gradual, and people don't really notice the change, but we all change. Well, during the making of the album, or the writing of the album anyway, I, I was having a hard time. I was struggling with one issue in my life, which was the fact that I cared a lot more about animals than I did about human beings. It's something that animal rights activists get accused of all the time, mm -hmm. and it had always angered me. Because people, people never care enough about animals or plant life or anything to begin with. And to think that once you do start caring, if someone does start caring about it, you get accused of not giving a damn about humans. You know, and most people say, we have starving people in, in the world. How dare you worry about animals when you should be worrying about people? Uh -huh. It's an arrogant thing to say. As far as I'm concerned, life is life. There's no right. differentiation. So the only problem is that I knew for me personally that it just might be true that I cared a little bit more about animals. Maybe uh -huh. I felt a little safer with animals than I did with people. The death of a human being would never quite stir me so much or, or hurt me so much physically mm -hmm. as the death of an animal. I needed to figure that out. So I kind of really thought about it a lot, took a long, hard look at myself, and I decided that the reason I can be so cold toward human life is because I am human life. I understand it. There are a lot of negative dark things about me mm -hmm. that exist in everyone and I'm very judgmental of myself I'm very critical of myself therefore I'm very judgmental and critical of everyone else um, animals on the other hand I cannot compare myself to they're, they're completely individual right. of their own species I don't understand a damn thing about them mm -hmm. that makes me able to love them more because I don't understand them I consider them to be innocent uh, and, <laughs> you know, it's kind of screwed up, but that's the way it is. So finally I decided, well, if I want to care as much about human beings as I do about animals, I have to start accepting myself more. So I, I started working on changing my habits and not being so judgmental of myself. Mm -hmm. Start accepting the darker things in myself, facing them and not repressing them, mm -hmm. not denying them. And then it made it so much easier for me to embrace other human beings who display the same characteristics. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> you know, I can't speak for anyone else, but it, it makes perfect sense to well, me. Well, you can. It m might not be valid, but <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, pro I proclaim that explanation to have made sense. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it really works for me. It really, I mean, it changed my life. I'm not... 100% there, but it's definitely something I'm striving for. I think that's important to um, be able to have an understanding of oneself on that sort of level. Yeah. I know I certainly am not there. <laughs> um, I don't think any of us are. It's, it's a lifelong process. Yeah. And there's one song on Equipoise called Closer, mm -hmm. which may or may not tie into this. Uh, well, it, it does in an obtuse kind of way. Obtuse. <laughs> it's just my favorite way. <laughs> the, the deal with Closer is that I come from a background of rejection. Mm hmm And when you're a child, if you're rejected constantly, and I was more rejected by peers than anything, not, not parents or adults, but my peers. And, and my peers were my social structure, mm -hmm. where my family was my family and I was never accepted by my peers. I was taunted, and I was tortured. 
and it uh, it kind of made my life a living hell. I also did not have a good time with uh, a, a step parent, and uh, that existence tortured me as a child. Also, mm-hmm. uh, it was kind of chaotic, and I was very unhappy, very unsafe. And you know, a lot of people go through childhoods like that. A lot of people go through childhoods that are horrible and worse than that. And uh, I'm really sorry about it, but that's the reality of the situation. However, we all grow older, and the older you get, the more you start understanding about why certain things had happened. Mm -hmm. But also, when you get older, you understand that it's okay to be pissed off about it. Because when you're a kid, you don't feel like you have a right to be angry. You don't don't even understand what's happening, Mm -hmm. let alone feel angry about it. I was really angry about a lot of the things that had happened to me. And I was very angry at a lot of the people that had done them. Even though I understand their actions. You know, we can understand till we're blue in the face. It doesn't mean you can't feel angry at the same time. So uh, I got angry and I wrote the song. There's one line in Closer that I really, I wonder, um, every word volunteered for my army. Right. Who's your army? My army would be me. Uh-huh. Uh, let's, let's really get obtuse now. Uh, it's difficult sometimes explaining why I write certain things because sometimes it comes and, and that's it. it there, there's, uh, if I try to elaborate it, I, I, on it, it comes out sounding more confusing than before. But I'll try on this <laughs> one. The word, the phrase prior to it is all the fears of the babes lay upon me and the two phrases go together all the fears of the babes lay upon me means all the taunting that I received from other children was coming out of a place of fear Mm -hmm. Um, because even children who liked me would taunt me out of fear of rejection from the others so everybody would join in yeah and that's why I say every word meaning everything they called me volunteered for my army every word that they threw at me just kind of made me stronger for the future you've really come i mean a long way in in many ways from just handing your tapes out to now you can walk into uh many major music chains and pick up your albums yeah all with very little radio airplay which is progressing. Probably not so much now. I mean, I well, just now. start now on the, on the hard report, which means that a lot of radio stations are playing both album cuts and the main cut, the single. Great. That's great. Yeah. The road to this has been... Long. Long. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your first album came out in 1986. Mm-hmm. Has that... I mean, how has that been for you to... Have you been discouraged at any time, or have you? are you just incredibly patient? Well, that's a really good question. And when I was 18 years old and just started recording, if, if anybody had said to me, or let me, let me rephrase this, if I were 19 when I was actually releasing music, mm-hmm. if anybody had said to me that, I wouldn't get to this point until I was 27 years old. It would have seemed like forever. Mm -hmm. I would have said, oh, I'll kill myself. (laughs) It's too long. I can't wait that long. And even now, I'm not uh, massively famous. I don't know. A funny thing happens. You know, it's sort of like you you live your life. And there's some point where you just realize that there's more to life than just one single thing that interests you mine being music and, and releasing albums. My life is a bunch of things. And luckily, that makes it easy to be very patient. Mm-hmm. And I think probably that it's that way with everyone. Well, maybe not everyone. <laughs> I, I thought about that. And I'm thinking, no, there are probably a lot of really impatient people out there who would like to be famous right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I, I don't know why it is with me. I, I, I know that when I was younger, I definitely wanted it very quickly. Uh-huh. But I also have a lot of trust in, in my own creation and what's going on. And I, I know that I wouldn't have been able to handle it if it happened quickly. Uh-huh. This way is a lot better for me. And uh, if it doesn't get any bigger than this, that would be okay with me. 
because I'm very, very gratified by what I'm doing.